Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> welcome and welcome back to uh, our colleagues and students. We've had a wonderful morning and early afternoon. And this is the final event of our conference, the HSS first annual interdisciplinary conference on the equality, justice, and democracy of elections 2012. Before I proceed to introduce our first panelist, uh, Christine, Dr. Christine Kelly has threatened me if I don't announce that there will be pizza for all of you at the Chang Library Auditorium for the third and final debate on Monday night, 8.30 to 10 p.m. So go hang out, uh, listen to the debates with this newfound knowledge and perspective that you will undoubtedly get here. Our first speaker today is Dr. Dorian T. Warren. He is Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science, the School of International and Public Affairs, and the Institute of Research in African American Studies at Columbia University. He's also a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and he specializes in the study of inequality and American politics. He's a native of Chicago with a PhD from Yale. He's worked with several national and local organizations, including the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the American Rights at Work, Jobs with Justice, the AFL-CIO, Unite Here, and the NGLTF Policy Institute. He currently serves on the boards of the Applied Research Center, the Center for Community Change, Align, the Model Alliance and the Discount Foundation, and he's appeared on several TV and radio programs commentating on public affairs. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Dorian T. Warren. Good afternoon. We can try that again. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you. It's great to be here. I want to especially thank Dean Davis and the organizing committee for inviting all of us here. This is quite a fantastic event and already has been a really stimulating discussion. I want to talk about the relationship between democracy and justice. And by justice, I mean social, racial, and economic justice. And I want to first start out by talking about electoral democracy, because democracy can take many different forms. And this is related to what's at stake, arguably, in this election. And that is competing visions of electoral democracy. And this has implications not only for what we might think of as the health of our democracy, but also for our record levels of inequality and income and wealth inequality, as well as gender and racial inequality. So one side of the political spectrum, I know it's nonpartisan here, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to endorse any candidates, I'm not going to talk about particular parties, unless you ask me at Q&A. <laughs> but one side of the political spectrum has a vision of continuing to expand democracy and make it as inclusive as possible while another side of the political spectrum has a vision of restricting democracy to exclude as many people from civic engagement as possible. And this is not a coincidence, and especially this is nothing new. Historically, since the advent of electoral democracy, elites have always sought to limit the ability of poor and disadvantaged populations' right to vote. Always. This is, again, not a new thing. For over 80% of American history, most people in the world were legally ineligible to become American citizens. So for the vast majority of our history, most people in the world were ineligible to become American citizens explicitly by law because of their race, nationality, or gender. And for more than two thirds of US history, the majority of the domestic adult population was ineligible for full citizenship, also because of race, nationality or gender. Now, every time we've expanded the electorate and expanded the franchise, there's been a backlash against fuller inclusion. And new mechanisms are often created to, and invented to suppress the vote. So in the post-Civil War Reconstruction era, if you think about the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave black men, not women, but black men, the right to vote for the first time. The response to this were Jim Crow laws all across the South, called black codes 
These consisted of literacy tests, poll taxes, felony disenfranchisement, and grandfather clauses. So unless your grandfather had voted, you couldn't vote. And for most black Americans, of course, their grandfathers and their fathers hadn't, hadn't voted before. And of course, when these legal mechanisms didn't work, there was always vigilante violence to prevent, dis, to prevent black Americans in particular from ex exercising their right to vote. So currently, we have a new wave of voter suppression laws. And we're having a, a debate about this in this country. And it, my interpretation is that these voter suppression laws are in response to the expansion of the electorate after what we might call the second reconstruction of the civil rights movement, of the women's movement, of the range of the expansion of our democracy from the 60s and 70s social movements. These current laws, mostly they're, they're voter ID laws, but there are other aspects of these laws that are important. It's not just about voter ID, it's about ending early voting, it's about ending same day registration, it's about trying to create as many obstacles for people to vote as possible, instead of trying to expand the electorate and allowing people to vote in the easiest sense, or in the easiest way. Just so you know, in terms of voting fraud, this is the argument often given for this new wave, this, the new wave of these laws, you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to find a case of voting fraud in this country. It's not an issue. Yet we have 33 states that have passed in the last four to five years some kind of voting suppression law. Now I tend to think that these laws update the 18th, 19th, and 20th century mechanisms of exclusion with newer 21st century strategies of vote suppression. Now again, I want to emphasize this is nothing new. Partisans are always battling over the rules of the game to give them an advantage in political contest. So, if you can't win an election outright, then you just try to rig the game. You try to rig the rules in your favor. Not only, by the way, are there these voter suppression laws on the books, there are efforts to monitor the polls often called poll watching. And this is a, essentially a form of voter intimidation. So the Tea Party in particular has a plan to go into urban, mostly people of color areas to monitor the polls and make sure no one is committing voter, voting fraud. Again, this is nothing new either. In fact, it was pioneered four decades ago as a strategy to restrict the electorate. We can go back to 1964 when the Republican National Committee launched what was called then a ballot security effort to monitor the polls. And in the early 80s when after being sued for violating the Voting Rights Act, the RNC then signed a consent decree agreeing to end the targeting of voters of color. So they weren't targeting white voters, they were targeting voters who they assumed were voting Democratic. So the main point I want to make here is that ultimately these laws that are trying to suppress the vote, they reflect the last gasp of a rapidly aging and mostly white political party that knows that the demographic numbers are not on their side, especially by the end of this decade. Again, if you can't win the contest fair and square, then you try to rig the game. So, this has implications, again, not just for the health of our democracy, but for questions of justice. And let me transition here to issues of inequality and poverty in particular. So the fear of electoral democracy by elites has always been what we might call the redistribution thesis. So if a majority of eligible voters in an electorate are poor or working class or middle class, and everyone has an equal vote, then the argument is that majority will use the vote to demand downward redistribution by the state. Essentially, the poor will soak the rich because they outnumber the rich in an ele electoral democracy. And we've seen, actually, very explicitly from speeches, from comments, from the debates, if you're watching the debates, I'm coming back on Monday for the free pizza. 
But if you pay attention to both candidates' views, especially on inequality and redistribution, you'll see a difference in terms of what one candidate wants to do is redistribute wealth and income upward, and another wants to redistribute wealth and income downward. Some would call this socialism. We can have that discussion. Um, but that's the fear of elites always in electoral democracy, is that they will be outnumbered by poor and working class voters and will be forced to have to give up some level of income or wealth. Now, why does this matter, especially at this moment? So about a little over a year ago, you probably heard of something called Occupy Wall Street. Raise your hand if you heard of Occupy Wall Street. OK, and what was the, what, what do you, what was the main meme from Occupy Wall Street? We are the 99%. The 1% versus the 99%. Well, two decades of social science research have been making that argument and showing with data how the 1% were doing very well in our country to the detriment of everybody else. So let me give you some numbers. From 1945 to roughly the mid-70s, Everybody, our country grew, we had lots of economic growth, and wages for the average family grew about 75% over that time. So we had increasing productivity, workers were being more productive, we were, we were, we were prosperous, and wages grew about 75%. From the mid-70s to about 2008, wages grew 4%. That's much less than inflation. So for most American workers, wages have been stagnant the last 30 or 40 years. Yet for the top 1%, they're, they're doing really well. And in fact, they take home about a quarter of the nation's income, which is a record only surpassed by what the 1% was taking home in 1928, right before the Great Depression. So the dilemma here is, I just said the mid-70s to roughly the present, we've seen wage stagnation among most poor, working, and middle-class families. But here's the dilemma. This is also a period when we've seen greater inclusion in American democracy, especially when you think about racial and ethnic groups and women, as well as lesbian and gay, bisexual and transgender folks. So on social issues, We've seen greater inclusion, greater equality among these different groups, while we've seen greater economic inequality among everybody, essentially. And the question is, well, what do we do about it? And what does electoral democracy have to do with ending the rising inequality and advancing a vision of justice? So I'm going to come back to that question towards the end. Let me give you just a few more examples of our what I would call our broken economy, and then I'll come back to what do we do now. So last year, the Department of Labor recovered $244 million in lost wages for workers, meaning employers did not pay their workers the minimum wage or overtime under the law. And so the Department of Labor had to sue the employers to win back wages. We call this wage theft. When people work, but they don't get paid what they're promised to get paid. A decade ago, there were about 2,000 of these 2,000 suits around wage theft. Last year, there were 7,000. So this is a growing phenomenon of workers just being cheated by their employers, essentially, by the 1%. Like I said, the 1% is doing very well. Partly, it's because of wage theft, not paying people for the hours they work. But also, we're in a context of a declining labor movement. In the mid-50s, about one in three workers was, were members of a union. Today, it's less than one in 10 in the private sector. So we had about 33% union membership in the mid-50s. Now we're down to less than 12%. And, and this has implications. Raise your hand, actually. I'm curious if you have a family member who's a member of a union. Well, a few of you. 
So this, this has implications also for inequality and economic justice, and I want you to think of it this way. What if we didn't have a, what if we didn't have a labor movement in this country? What if unions all went away tomorrow? What would the workplace look like? What would inequality look like? What would our democracy look like? If you're a member of a union, you're much more likely to vote and participate in politics. If you're a member of a union and you're a woman, the wage gap between men and women is much less. Or if you're black or Latino, the wage gap between you and whites are much less. So unions not only offer a premium when it comes to wages and benefits, but also a political premium because they mobilize their members to get out to vote. So we see wage stagnation for 40 years, a declining labor movement, this new phenomenon that I mentioned called wage theft. And the question is, oh, I, I forgot to mention unemployment, right? The overall unemployment rate, the good news is that it was 7.8%. But in lots of major cities, and especially for blacks and Latinos, unemployment is at depression era levels. If you look at Detroit, for instance, unemployment is over 20% for black folks in Detroit. So unemployment's a huge problem. We have a, an issue around job creation in terms of not only getting people employed, but one out of every three jobs is a low wage job. And then if you can get one of those jobs, you have to deal with this problem of wage theft. They're, it's likely a non-union job. So these are all issues, broadly speaking, related to the question of economic justice. And the question here is, well, what's the relationship of electoral democracy to economic justice? If you have a party that has a vision of economic justice, and we unfortunately only live in a two-party system, so the choices are limited, then you can do things like have a Department of Labor that enforces the existing law around wage theft. If you have a party, or, and by party I mean pres presidency, Congress, it's not enough just to win the presidency, as we've learned the last four years, I think, but you have to have a Congress, too, that can advance a legislative agenda. So if, if you have all of these things, it's still not enough, especially if you go home after Election Day. So the, the one thing that we've learned over the last four years is that no matter who wins in November, electoral democracy is never enough to advance social and economic justice. In fact, we actually need social movements to do that. And there's actually a long-term relationship between the role of social movements and electoral democracy. All major advances in this country around justice have not come through elections. They've come alone. They've come through the combination of an electoral strategy as well as pressure from social movements. So whether it's the abolitionist, whether it's the suffragists in the early 20th century, the civil rights movement in the 60s, there was always a social movement advancing justice claims, but tied together to an electoral strategy. So the thing we've learned the last four years is that after Election Day, we have to organize and mobilize continually, and we can see the difference between those social movements that did so and those that didn't. So if you think of the immigrant rights movement, if you think of the LGBT movement, if you think of the women's movement in terms of what's, what happened with Planned Parenthood, all the movements that are active, and not just on election day, those are the movement, those are the areas in which we advance social justice. So there's still a promise of, of electoral democracy advancing justice, but remember, elites are always scared of electoral democracy, always. And even when poor and working class people might win at the polls, it's not enough. It's never enough without a social movement in place to continue to push for a vision of equality, a vision of social justice, a vision of economic and racial and gender justice. So I'll end there. I think I've gone over my time.
and leave it to my two colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Warren. Our next speaker, uh, the esteemed Howard McGarry, Professor of Philosophy at Rutgers University with a PhD from the University of Minnesota. His research is just as timely as our other two panelists, focusing on collective responsibility, compensatory justice, distributive justice, justice and the distribution of health care, political liberalism, race and racism, and the virtues, especially forgiveness, which I hope you could teach us something about. <laughs> Uh, his books include most uh, recently in 2012, The Post-Racial Ideal, uh, and as well as Race and Social Justice, and Between Slavery and Freedom, Philosophy and American Slavery. Please welcome Dr. Howard McGarry. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for putting together this uh, one-day conference. Uh, I, I really appreciate the invitation. I've learned so much so far, right, and I'm sure it will continue. It's always a pleasure for me to be in the company of uh, my good friend, Linda, and I enjoyed her talk very much uh, this morning. I also want to thank Dean Davis. And I also uh, want to thank Steve Thompson, right, for uh, I, I think playing some role in getting me here, right? So I appreciate it very much. Um, and all of the other organizers. Um, this man here has made my job a lot easier, <laughs> you know? So in a way, you know, he stole a little bit of my thunder, but that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm gonna cut out some of the things I would, going to say, because you said them in a very good way, I think. Okay. So m believe me, this is no critique of him, right? We had no knowledge of what we were going to say at all, right? So this is how it should be, right? Things all connect together. So I call what I'm doing the 212 elections and the issue of democratic equality and participation. Okay. So hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of what I have to say. Uh, in the wake of the current presidential campaign and the election of President Barack Obama, there is a speculation in the media and in the general public about whether the United States is now a post-racial society. Right? Now, for popular discussions of this idea, if you want to read something about this, uh, I would suggest Randall Kennedy's book, The Persistence of the Color Line, that's New York Random House, 2011, and a book that Linda also referenced by Touré, Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness, okay? So these two books will, you know, give you some sense about what people have thought or meant by this idea of the post-racial society. The idea that we have entered or are on the verge of moving beyond race is applauded by some commentators and condemned by others. Some commentators have welcomed the idea of a post-racial America, while others have expressed reservations about the value and wisdom of such a society. Unfortunately, this controversy has raged without a substantive discussion about the meaning of a post-racial America. The term post-racial has been used to describe a range of views that run the gamut. One of the more common conceptions of a post-racial United States, one is one where we move beyond race, where no one thinks about race anymore, but instead we're able to see one another as individuals. Because we have put some of the ugly aspects of US history behind us. A more cautious view of post-racial America is one that calls for an end to anti-black racism in America, where white privilege is removed from the country's identity. Here, we have two different conceptions of what it means to usher in a post-racial America. The first account of post-racial America proceeds on the assumption that thinking about race means that we cannot respect others as individuals. The idea is that race thinking prevents us from interacting with others as individuals. 
Racism is so embedded in our racial thinking, we can't deconstruct it. The view also assumes that because races are not natural kinds, we can't, in good faith, talk about races. Race theorists like the philosopher Anthony Appiah have held a version of this position. This conception relies on a fairly commonly held view of racial ontology. This conception relies uh, one, one that questions the metaphysical reality of race and thus concludes that races cannot have a moral or social reality if they don't exist on an ontological level. However, even if races cannot be aptly described as natural kinds, there may be good reasons for thinking they are social kinds. Appia, however, believes that racial identities in the end even if we describe them as social kinds, okay, rely on incoherent metaphysical claims and on questionable moral assumptions about what we owe to each other. He even goes so far as to recommend that the liberal state engage in soul making. By soul making, he means giving the state the authority to sustain, reshape, and even create the social identities of its citizens. He argues that given the state this authority will increase the chances of citizens living ethically successful lives. The view also assumes that eliminating race is necessary for escaping our awful racial history. This assumption is thought to be parasitic on the first. The idea is that racism has so been such an integral part of the makeup of this country that the only way to overcome these damaging effects is to completely get rid of uh, racial identities. However, you, as you can imagine, critics question whether addressing our racial past and present require us to abandon racial identities altogether. They believe it may only require us to rethink to think about our racial identities in very different ways. The second way of understanding the post-racial ideal does not require the elimination of the idea of race. Instead, it points to the horrendous effects of things like anti-black racism and argues that our goal should be, to be to eliminate racism in its overt and subtle forms. And by doing so, we can preserve the benign racial identities. On this view, it is unnecessary to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Since my focus okay, in this session is on the democratic process, I wish to explore this process in the wake of the alleged post-racial ideal. What does it mean? Does it invalidate the explicit use of racial groups in the political process? What would it mean? Does it call for universal citizenship defined as what individuals have in common rather than their difference? Inequality is defined as, on this reading, blindness to individual and group differences. However, this way of understanding the political process is described as oppressive, especially by uh, the philosopher, political scientist, Irish Young. She contends that we must recognize special groups, if a special group rights, if we are to effectively combat disadvantage and oppression. On the other hand, her critics reject racial coalitions and politics in favor of colorblind universalism. However, Young sticks to her guns and rejects this false universalism. But she recognizes that simply acknowledging group rights won't be enough to eliminate disadvantage and oppression without greater participation by the disadvantaged groups. If Young is right about this, it is imperative for the just society to do those things that encourages voter participation. In the 212 elections, politicians and political commentators often operate with one of the above assumptions about what it means to be post-racial. The idea of equality is a cornerstone of a democratic form of government. However, 
Historically, scholars have recognized a tension between democracy and equality. Critics of democracy and even some of its supporters have argued that the masses are often ill-suited to making political decisions that are good for the nation state. However, the claim that all citizens should have a say in electing leaders has not gone unchallenged. We have clear instances where citizens who are members of certain groups have been denied participation. And sometimes this denial has been overt, but it has often been covert. For example, using literacy tests to decide who may participate. This is why critics like Booker T. Washington, the famous inventor and educator, challenge using a lack of education as a bar to participation. Other criteria like income levels and poverty and property ownership have been rejected as bars to participation. And a primary reason why we are skeptical about a barring adult citizens' participation is that we are not willing to give authority to just any particular citizen. Right? So participation right, comes with some criteria right, in our democracy. So, I mean, you know, 13-year-olds can't vote, right? Uh, if you're, some people go to war, but they can't vote, right? Republican state legislatures around the country have revived the debate about who should be allowed to participate in the democratic process. The enactment of voter ID laws in certain states has caused many Democrats to cry foul. They believe that this requirement violates the equal protection requirement, which is so crucial to the legitimacy of the democratic process. But of course, Republicans say, when the Democrats cry foul, that this is only politics, right? Uh, they believe, uh, uh, unfortunately, the debate over these laws has been primarily, and this is important, unfortunately, the debate over these laws has been primarily procedural rather than substantive. By this, I mean the commentators have accepted the moral and legal legitimacy of requiring voter IDs and then place their focus on whether the state can fairly and reasonably adopt procedures to allow citizens to obtain IDs. Critics claim that poor people and elderly African Americans face unfair burdens and hurdles in their efforts to obtain voter IDs. But little attention is given to whether it is fair or just in the first place to require voter IDs. Why has this issue of voter IDs been so high on the agenda of the Republican Party or Republican legislators? Of course, they claim that they only want to ensure the integrity of the electoral process. But the crucial question for them is, why now? Has there been a dramatic increase in voter fraud? Critics say no. They claim that their intentions are political and not motivated by a desire to eliminate voter fraud. However, in response to this charge, most Republicans deny that this is the case. But the empirical evidence for significant letters of levels of voter fraud does not exist. My own view is that the large turnout for President Obama by certain groups has certainly motivated the effort. But even if this is true, this does not answer the question whether we should take steps to eliminate or reduce voter fraud. If there is no clear evidence that signifies levels of voter fraud, that voter fraud exists. The second topic I wish to explore draws on two understandings of why democracy is preferable to other forms of government. One account of value of democracy focuses on the alleged better outcomes that result from the democratic process. The second account focuses on the procedural fairness of democracy. In other words, it is the procedure that counts, not the outcomes. These ways of understanding democracy parallel the way Western political philosophers have characterized equality. 
These theorists draw a distinction between equality of results and equality of opportunity. And then they debate about what weight, if any, should be given to each ideal. The famous political philosopher, Harvard philosopher, John Rawls, influential kind of distributive justice has been seen by many as providing us with a decision procedure for deciding the proper weight to be given to each of the two ways of understanding equality. However, political libertarians question Rawls' insistence on guaranteeing certain primary goods for all citizens, while more left-leaning egalitarians question whether Rawls' commitment to equality of results goes far enough. Some folks have argued that given the history of racism, sexism, and xenophobia, that justice demands that certain outcomes are unacceptable. For example, cases where racial minorities and women stand for election, but none or very few of them are ever elected to political office. Lonnie Gournier, a Harvard professor and a supporter of procedural democracy, has suggested modifications to our present democratic procedures that will minimize the possibility of such outcomes. Her suggestions are as follow. One, something she calls cumulative voting. Voters get the same number of votes as there are seats and options to vote for, and then they can distribute their votes in a combination to reflect their preferences. And the idea here is this. It's like, uh, say for example, if you are a black, uh, say you are a green student in an all yellow school, right? And you're gonna have a prom, and you want to decide what music is gonna be played at the prom, right? So each, you get a vote, we have the one person, one vote rule, right? But what she's suggesting is that you should give people more than one vote, right? And they can rank order their votes, so this creates a greater likelihood, right, that people would be included who would traditionally be excluded. Race conscious districting. Legislative districting constructed in such a way that certain groups who have historically not had their interests fairly represented can do so. Districts are based on ensuring equal opportunity to ensure various outcomes rather than geography. Right? So she's saying, right, given certain historical outcomes where people have been oppressed and disenfranchised, that it should be permissible to construct voting districts with race in mind, right? So if you've ever seen some, have you, any of you seen any of these district maps, how they look, right? You know, they look crazy, right, how they're drawn. Right? But she's just suggesting that race can be and should be used. Of course, Grenier's remarks are controversial, right? I present them here only to demonstrate one account of how to achieve equal opportunity when it comes to voting procedures. Guarnier's critics, on the hand, other hand, would certainly question whether we can guarantee the desired outcomes without changing the process in unacceptable ways. That's what they say. They believe tinkering with requirements like one person, one vote rule, that doing so will create a class of political experts that know in advance the will of the majority or which outcome is preferable. <laughs> David Estlin, uh, the Brown professor of philosophy, believes that moving directly from expertise to authority, though, is a fallacy that he calls the expert boss fallacy. He says, just because you know more does not give you authority over others. Their consent to your authority is required for the imposition of your expert proposal to be accepted as legitimate, right? So even if you are an expert, and if you grant that you're an expert, your consent is still required, right, for legitimacy. Because I question the idea that the judgment of the so-called political experts should be substituted for the will of the people, I want the power to remain in the hands of the people, but fairly defined. No other decision procedure should be substituted for de the democratic will of the people, even if from a God's eye point of view, the procedure was better at locating the truth. 
our reason for preferring a properly defined democracy is moral rather than epistemological. Democracy properly constituted gives each citizen a fair chance to influence the outcomes. It does not guarantee that the process, or should it guarantee that the process, will always or even typically lead to the best decision. And in order to do this, I think the most direct road to that is greater participation, right, rather than less. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McGill. <coughs> and we've come to our third and final panelist, and we hope to ha we will have time for a great discussion at least 10 to 15 minutes long. So stick around. Okay, Dr. Kelly Dittmar, she is the Assistant Research Professor at the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers Eagleton Institute of Politics. Her research focuses on the role of gender and in political institutions and the gender dynamics of U.S. campaigns and elections. She recently received her PhD one year ago, I think yesterday, <laughs> congratulations, uh, from Rutgers University, and recently completed a congressional fellowship through the American Political Science Association, <clears throat> where she worked as a legislative aide for Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut on the labor, health, human services, and education portfolio. Uh, Dittmar, Dr. Dittmar has also previously worked for Governor Jennifer Granholm of Michigan, and she promises to enlighten us as well. Please warmly welcome her. I will try to enlighten. Um, let me get up. I have a little bit of uh, I have some numbers, so I want to bring up the presentation. So um, I want to just, uh, again, kind of reiterate, as my other co-panelists have said, thank you to the organizing committee, to Dr. Davis, um, to the university for, for bringing me here. This is fun. I uh, have a lot of colleagues that have um, degrees from William Patterson and have heard great things, and so I'm glad to be here. And also thanks to the students for showing up. That's always a good sign. Um, uh, thanks as well to, to Dr. Swarren McGarry for sort of letting me be in your company. I'm the new novice uh, PhD in the crowd, and so it's, it's always nice to be um, next to the experts as well. Um, so I'm here in, in kind of two capacities. I study gender and politics um, and, and, you know, did a lot of work um, and have done a lot of work on gender and campaigns. I sort of wore my political hat in um, working with women who have served in office. But then I also am um, here representing the Center for American Women in Politics. We are um, a nonpartisan research center housed at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers um, in New Brunswick. And we do a number of research, um, research projects and programs aimed at advancing women in politics and really try to work um, at that nexus of research and practice. Um, so how can we talk about and, and use what we know in terms of research to uh, inform programs that will engage women, um, educate women about what they might need or want to run for office or um, become leaders in the community, um, and do those things kind of simultaneously and then let the programs inform the research, et cetera. So I'm excited about the work we do and at the end I'm going to plug one of our programs for all of the students in the room. But um, as we're here to talk about equality, justice, and democracy, I think it's interesting that the panelists before me have talked a lot about um, participation and democracy in terms of participation and sort of of the public, right? Um, and one thing that, that I'm going to focus on today is really sort of the elite side of this. Um, how do we um, get women in office? Where do we stand today and why? Um, but I think before I do that, I want to say that there's a lot to be said about gender and voting, gender um, and participation. And we see that in the campaign right now. So for all of you who have watched the debate, uh, the debates. Um, there wasn't much mention of women in the first one, um, but we did have, you know, a, I think an increasing dialogue after the second debate about how the candidates are talking about gender, um, how they are trying to appeal to women, why they're doing so, because women vote at higher rates than men do, and what the historic differences have been in the women's vote. So I'm happy to talk about that some more if, if you're interested in the Q&A, but I'll focus for the purposes of this presentation on, on women um, as candidates and office holders. So let me start um, with some numbers. Um, I think numbers help us to set the stage. Um, 
Today, in terms of women in elected office, women make up 16.8% of the U.S. Congress. That's 17 members of the Senate, 73 members of the House of Representatives out of 435. To give you um, a little bit more shades in that, there, is, there are no women of color um, in the U.S. Senate. Um, and overall, about 4.5% of the Congress um, is women of color. Um, in terms of state legislatures, uh, about 23.7% of state legislators around the country are women. And in executive offices like gubernatorial offices and mayors, our representation um, a bit lower. We have six governors, six seated governors, and we will definitely decline in this election in terms of the number of female governors. We already know that, which is sort of a sad state of affairs. Um, and we have about 17% of mayors of big cities, and we count those cities of over 30,000 um, being women. So where does this put us globally to give you a sense of things? Um, we rank 80th in the world. This is out of 184 countries surveyed by the Interparliamentary Union. Um, what this measures, just to give you sort of a good sense of, of what we're looking at, is this is the lower um, house of the national parliament. So in our system, it's the House of Representatives. So our number that we put into this is 16.8%. That's 80th. We actually have 96 countries that are ranked ahead of us when you count for ties and things like that. Um, so we're not, we're about in the 50th percentile. So, you know, barring some of our cheers of like America being number one, um, We've got a ways to go, at least in this regard, and I would argue in others, and largely because they're tied to, I think, representation. Um, again, just another visual representation. When you look at the percentage of women in Congress since 1971, which is when the Center for American Women in Politics sort of began, and we began keeping all of these numbers, um, we see sort of some gradual increases not as fast as we would need to reach any sense of parity, which would be 50% or a little more since we represent over 50% of the population. Um, and even after this jump in 1992, which you can see very clearly, if you look at the blue line, which is the House of Representatives, um, we see that jump. We had 24 new women elected um, in 1992. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the comparison of that year, why that happened, and what we're looking at in 2012. Um, but you see that jump. And then you see sort of gradual, but really what we have, have talked about in literature and at the center as a really sort of flatlining or plateau of women in office. And actually in 2010, we saw the first decline um, in women in office, both at the congressional level and at the state legislative level that we had seen in, in over 30 years. Um, so why is that? Um, what is happening to, why aren't we seeing greater participation of women? Um, I think, you know, as Dr. Warren talked about, about the sort of greater inclusion, movements, participation. Why are we not seeing that translate necessarily um, into women in elected office? Um, and so we have some, some theories about that and some things we could possibly do. Um, again, when you look at the percentage of the women in state legislatures, you see that flatlining, I think, even more clearly. Um, you see a sort of rise, then 1992 comes, we see this sort of peak, and then we flatlined again in terms of the percentage of women in office. Um, I want to talk a little bit before I move on to this election about that historic comparison with 1992, just to give you a sense. Um, so how many of you in the room, I asked this question to a group this morning, are sort of familiar with the phrase year of the woman in 1992? <sighs> All right, educating. Um, so, so 1992, in 1992, we saw a number of factors sort of in the political climate that you could sort of argue were good for women in terms of opening, um, opening up some opportunities, but also engaging women in the political process. Um, there were sort of four pieces of that that I want to mention. Uh, one, uh, tie, two things sort of tied together that every 10 years we have a census. Um, and after that, so the next election after that census, so 1992 is one year, 2012 another year, um, we have a redrawing of those maps that we were talking about. Um, and districts sort of shake up. You see this in New Jersey where we're losing a congressional seat. See this throughout the country. What happens is those sorts of, that sort of shake up creates opportunities, creates opportunities for people that may be newcomers to the political system. So they may not be ingrained in 
uh, a party system. Um, they may have been just waiting and biding their time until the opportunity arise. Um, and it allows for this sort of opportunity, again, for political newcomers, of which women still are. Um, in addition to that sort of shakeup, we also saw additional open seats in 1992 due to some scandals at the congressional level in particular, um, where men, uh, some men were sort of pushed out of their seats. And stereotypically, um, voters tend to see women as more honest, um, less likely to be engaged in these sort of scandals. So that's sort of a stereotypical advantage that we saw in that year. In addition, we were seeing post-war, post-Cold War politics, so the policy agenda was also a bit more advantageous to women in terms of people's expectations of, of expertise, so more d discussion about domestic policy. We were going into talking about social welfare and welfare policy. Um, and finally, and I think um, probably the most um, visual and sort of guttural response um, was that there was a, a number of hearings for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearings um, where women were watching TV and they were watching as Anita Hill, an African-American young woman, spoke about Clarence Thomas and talked about sexual harassment, that she had been harassed by this um, Supreme Court nominee. She was speaking in front of an all-white, all-male uh, panel of senators. And that, that literal you know, uh, uh, image of no women, no persons of color, and this, this woman speaking to this group, and really a sense that she wasn't being taken seriously due to the lines of questioning, um, really, really sort of enraged, um, but also inspired women to get involved in that electoral year. What we saw is women filing in much greater numbers. They won, those, um, won in many of those situations in their primaries and were able to increase their numbers in office. Um, again, we had 24 new women in 1992. However, we still only had uh, representation 10% um, of women in Congress after 1992. So we call it the year of the woman because we saw this huge increase. Sadly, the increase was only up to 10%. So our victories are sort of short and small lived. Um, and, and I think in 2012, we have to be careful of the same thing. So we have much of the same uh, uh, climate happening in terms of redistricting, open seats, um, and even the engagement of women, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with the Sandra Fluke incident in Congress, um, where there was a panel of all men talking about contraception, there was similar sort of engagement and, and anger. Um, but what we, what we think, and I'll get to the punchline when I go through some of the uh, numbers, is we may, in a, if all planets align, get to 20%, unlikely, but even if we did. Um, that means over 20 years, um, we could have doubled our numbers of women in office. We're still one-fifth, and we're probably not going to even get there. So I think all of this is to temper our expectations, but also temper um, our excitement to say we've got a lot to go. Um, I wanted to give you one other number uh, just as a, to give you a sense of sort of the, the progress over time. From the early 1970s through the late 1990s, the number and percentage of women in the state legislator, le legislatures increased fivefold. So we went from 4.5% in 1971 to 22.4% in 1999. Currently, we're at 23.7%. So if you do the math, um, we've had a net increase of 1.3% in the last 13 years. So when we talk about flatlining again, it's just yet another sort of representation of that. So where are we at in 2012? I talked about the context. Um, uh, in addition to the census year, um, both 1992 and 2012 are presidential years. We see more participation overall in those years, and uh, particularly among women. And so that's usually advantageous for women candidates. And we'll see how it turns out this year. So what do we expect this year? So political scientists, despite our attempts to the contrary, are not always the best at forecasting elections. Uh, so let me preface it that way. But let me at least show you where we stand. Um, in the House, we have a record number of women filed for US House seats this year. That led to a record number of women um, becoming actual nominees or candidates, winning their primary. So 163 women. Of those, 
um, 29 uh, are running for open seats, meaning they have a better chance, right? It's hard to run against somebody who's won for a long time. Um, and 66 are incumbents. So more than half are, are folks who, who potentially have a better chance to win. That's a good sign. In the Senate, uh, we have 18 nominees for the U.S. Senate. Um, again, another record um, in 2012 for women, and the likelihood of getting uh, up to 20 women in the Senate is actually a real possibility um, if some of these races break. So you've probably heard about Elizabeth Warren in a competitive race in Massachusetts, um, uh, Heidi Heitkamp, um, Linda McMahon potentially in Connecticut, although I think it, I don't think that break, might be breaking the other way, but we'll see. And then in Hawaii, um, we have a woman-woman race, Linda Lingle running against Maisie Hirono, um, so we're guaranteed um, a woman senator either way in that race. In terms of gubernatorial numbers, um, as I mentioned, it's sort of a sad state of affairs. We have one woman running for governor in the general election this year, and um, that's Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. And we have four women returning. So the most we could have is five, and the least we could have is four, which will be another decrease in the number of women governors. Now, 2014 will be a gubernatorial election year, so we'll, we'll see what that brings. Finally, um, in terms of state legislatures, it's really hard to predict, but what we know is we have more women nominees in 2012 than we did in 2008, um, less than we did in 2010, but women did not do very well in 2010, um, largely because a lot of these candidates are Democrats, as women um, are uh, tend to be about 60-40. Um, and so uh, they did not do very well in 2010. It'll be interesting to see what happens, and it'll probably be much guided by the presidential race and down ticket on the ballot um, to see how they do in 2012. Um, things to watch for in 2012, as I mentioned, New Hampshire um, could be not only the only state who could see a new woman governor in 2012, but it also has the potential to have an all-female congressional delegation, the only state that could potentially have this. Again, we're not sure that this is a very likely possibility, but they do have two women sitting senators. They have two House seats, of which there are women running for both. Um, and they have uh, a woman running for governor. Um, that would be unprecedented um, in, in terms of women's representation. And, and then I mentioned already the woman-woman Senate race in Hawaii. Um, again, I don't want to give too many estimates on the numbers. I would say to, to, to sort of keep your eye on this. It'd be interesting to see um, our, ho our wishful thinking would be 20%. Um, our thoughts are that we may get up to 18% from 17% um, and see some increase of women in office. Um, and again, at the state legislative level, much harder to tell, but again, we hope to get back up to, we were at 24.5% before the last election, and maybe we can make up some ground. All right. So why do the numbers matter? We go through a lot of numbers. Um, I like to preface sort of a lot of talks with sort of where we're at, because I think a lot of times people are unaware that we're so low in terms of globally and, and in the country in terms of the representation of women. Um, but it's not just about, I think, counting beans, right? We don't just talk about um, numbers um, because numbers in and of themselves matter, but they are representative of some of the things we're talking about today. Okay. Um, and so uh, want to talk about why it matters, and that's because we know that women make a difference in office. And we do a lot of research on this, and I want to talk about sort of three quick ways and how, how they matter. One, we know that women make a difference in the policies that are passed. This is the substantive representation that bring, women bring to office. Um, our research shows that women represent women's interests, champion women's issues, and are more often likely to work across the aisle with other women and, and men on the other side. Um, most striking um, in some of our research, and this, was true, this has been true for decades, is that Republican women are actually more likely than Democratic men to have worked on legislation that is uh, helping women, or in their minds, in their, their perspective, this is a survey of women voters to help women. Um, both men and women legislators report that female legislators feel a sense of responsibility to women and affect the extent to which legislators consider how legislation affects women and also the type of legislation that is passed um, and proposed. So there are a lot of number of ways in which women substantively influence uh, policies in government. We also know that they influence the process in terms of bipartisanship. 
um, in terms of institutional dynamics that they, they influence. Their uh, more inclusive and cooperative uh, studies have shown in terms of their committee work and leadership. And they're also more engaged with their communities and constituents. Actually, when we pull uh, constituents, they, they often feel more engaged in the process when represented by a woman. And there's a lot to, to weed out about that. Um, but we, we find that as a consistent finding. Um, and finally, women in office can act as role models. Um, getting women to feel that, off, that office holding is accessible to them and that they have efficacy or a feeling that they can influence decisions, that they can sort of be a part of this process from the inside um, is pretty essential. And so I think we've seen this um, with both race and gender. In 2008, there was sort of um, a potential change in some psyche um, around what you could potentially be or what your role in formal politics could be simply by seeing um, both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton on a major presidential, in a major presidential race. Um, and so we would argue, and, and I think research would argue, that there is some role model effect of having women both in office and running for office. Okay, um, I'm not going to get to sort of some of the reasons about sort of where we, why we have this stagnation in numbers, but I'd like to just, you know, throw out there a couple of things. Women tend to um, think that they can do things outside of office. They're dealing with biases in the institution um, and also with um, fears of raising funds and a lack of recruitment. And that's some of the work we do at the center. Um, last thing I'll say, let me just go to the last thing. Um, about what, what we think and what we would propose in terms of sort of some changes. Recruitment efforts of women in office is essential. Um, we do this at the center through a lot of our programs. We need some changes in terms of party leadership and prioritization of increasing the diversity of individuals in office, the folks you recruit to run and the folks you support to win. Increase awareness. So you need to tell your friends how many women are in office, but we also need to do a better job of talking about why it matters. Um, recognizing political opportunities and taking advantage of them. And then lastly, and this is the institutional discussion that we could have all day, is changing the actual gender dynamics within the institution of politics, within campaigns, um, and within uh, pol political office. Because without that, you have women who feel that they are not included um, and that they don't want to be a part of it. And you also present them barriers um, that make it really difficult to not only get in, but also to be successful within the institution. So I apologize for going over a little bit, but um, hope to answer some questions about it. Uh, students, I promise that we will have you out of here free as birds at 314, but if you could just, we, we would like to have listen and learn a bit more and an opportunity for you guys to all ask questions. So 314, you will be set free, okay? Um, so would anyone like to have a question for any of the panelists or all three together? As you saw, uh, their, all their talks were very well integrated. Uh, because of the great planning of the committee, as well as um, resonated with earlier talks of Dr. Alcoff, um, Janine Fris Frisbee LaRue, as well as Dr. Kelly. Yes. Uh, my name is Lisa Zakins. Um, I guess I have a question for uh, either Dr. Warren or McGarry, but all three of you can answer. Um, what role do you think that um, affirmative action in colleges plays in the issues that you guys talk about? Thank you. Uh, well, if I, I think an important thing about participation uh, in, the, in the political process is having qualified people, right? Having trained people. So to the extent that affirmative action helps to achieve that, then uh, I think that would be a good thing. Um, just a, a couple of thoughts on, on this. One, in terms of what we know of the last, say, 40 years of affirmative action, one is it's benefited women much more than racial minorities, especially in the workplace. Um, but second, what we've been seeing um, the last, I'd say, 20 years, and I see this especially um, at Columbia where I teach, is we get 
a lot of racial minorities as students, we get a lot of black and Latino students, but not working class or middle class black and Latino students. These are students that have gone to prep schools. They're not first generation college students. They're just as prepared and, and have all the extra benefits and advantages as many of their white peers because of their income and wealth backgrounds. So where affirmative action has benefited, I'd say again more recently, has benefited black and Latino students, it's been wealthier ones. Um, but then, I, you know, there's a current Supreme Court case that was argued just two weeks ago, which I'm convinced it's going to end affirmative action in higher education. Not so much hope there. Yes. Hi, my name is Sue Patel. I'm an adjunct professor here, and I just wanted to piggyback on the affirmative action uh, because my question is about the Supreme Court and mm. their um, uh, their potential ruling on affirmative action, um, and also their um, probable upcoming case of about same-sex marriage, and the fact that um, the next president will probably be able to name up to four Supreme Court justices because four of them are over 70. And I'd like to, uh, you know, that scares the heck out of me um, because I, you know, it could be really bad if it goes to the person who I don't want to win. So um, <laughs> can I have your thoughts on that? And, um, you know, I thought that at the last election and nobody ever talked about it, and at the last debate, nobody talked about any LGBT issues or about affirmative action. And instead, they, they're talking about semantics in the Rose Garden. Right. Um, and and oh, binders of women, too. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Also, and Mitt Romney did not get have those binders. A group of women approached him with them and asked him to, um, you know, to please put some women in office. And by the end of his term, he had let go most of them. So. Uh, Dr. Warren and Dr. McGarry, before you proceed, I don't want you to think our students are so rude, but perhaps that we can all let them applaud for you and then we can extend our discussion and have this little mass exodus for the students that are going to class. So students, please, a warm uh, round of applause for our three panelists. And, and if you need to go, Perhaps we can give you guys a minute to shuffle out, and then our panelists can continue uh, answering questions for a few more minutes. Just, in, just in, re in response to that question, I was just asking Dr. Dittmar if, if, if she had numbers on the number of female judges, because I always suspect they're just like the numbers on women elected officials, very low, and that's another way in which I think not just this election, but all elections matter in the sense that at the local and state level, judges are often elected and not appointed. Um, and obviously, there's a question of substantive representation in terms of what women bring to, to the court that's different from what men bring in terms of a perspective or a view um, that's, that goes beyond what we would call descriptive representation. And there's no doubt that in that case, we've had you know, pretty blatant statements from both um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and actually our most recent sort of female justices talking about the influence of their gender sort of freely and their race um, and, and people critiquing them for that, which is interesting with the court, something we always sort of have to weed out with students and sort of understanding is this a representative position um, in nature or by its nature, um, they represent the Constitution, not their gender, but I think they do a good job of parsing out how that could influence um, how they read um, and, and talk about a case. And there's some good, good examples, which may speak a little bit to, to even to both the affirmative action and LGBT case, uh, same-sex marriage cases that could come up. Also, I think to your question about uh, what the candidates are discussing, you know, <clears throat> we're not powerless in helping them to put issues on the agenda. And what we have to do is, you know, become much more active in getting them to talk about the things that we want them to talk about. Right? And uh, we're, we're not very good at it, right, uh, on the local level or the national level. And this, I just want to piggyback on that because this is the point I was trying to make about social movements. So for both LGBT activists 
and immigrant rights activists. They engaged in many, many, many acts of civil disobedience against President Obama and his administration. Lots of people got arrested at, on the lawn of the White House trying to get their issues on the agenda in a way that we didn't see from other interest groups or constituencies. So that there's always the, the way in which we can always agenda set by forcing issues on the agenda when President Obama didn't want to deal with the question of immig immigration reform or dreamers in particular. He, he didn't really want to. Not, um, but then this, but you know, also what you said makes me think about Dr. Alcoff's comments earlier on whiteness, and that is if, you had, if we were to go back 15 years and think about public opinion, think about attitudes towards lesbian and gays today, I don't think it, most of us would have assumed that we would have made as much progress as we have in such a short amount of time. And I think a lot of that is driven by a generational change, but not exclusively generational. So something's been going on. This would be a great dissertation or a senior thesis. The media, too. Right? There's something, yeah, yeah media is a big part of it. So, mm -hmm. but, but obviously advocacy and activism. So something's happened the last decade alone that's really advanced LGBT rights when I don't think most people would have predicted that. We have a long way to go, make no mistake about it. But it's interesting to think about that in comparison to, say, gender or race. Are there similar kinds of strategies across different marginalized groups that we can think through how to advance questions of equality and justice? And that's an open question. I don't, I don't really know. You know, billboards are very effective, too. Uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and they're not that expensive, relatively hmm. speaking. Yes, this will be our last question. And from a student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to ask like, about a hot topic that's been going on in the debate based on like, with the economy and job creation uh, and the type of revival of the middle class. Um, in this new age of America where Facebook and Apple are the multi-billion dollars companies of the world and them not creating much jobs, how do you see the middle class getting back on its feet? <laughs> That's a Barack Obama. <laughs> uh, first question is what middle class? No. Um, this is a huge dilemma that all of us, and especially your, your generation, is going to have to grapple with. And there are no easy answers. So I'll try and be as succinct as possible. The creation of the middle class of the 20th century essentially came from the New Deal. So a range of, of social policies passed, like Fair Labor Standards Act, which set a minimum wage, offered overtime. The Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which allowed workers the right to organize for the first time into unions. So legislation from the New Deal period, along with a growing labor movement of workers organizing into unions in manufacturing industries, that, that created, and rising education rates, if you think of the GI Bill for returning veterans after World War II, who got to go to college, mostly all first generation, and get a college education. So that was in the context of a closed economy, meaning we weren't engaged in international trade, for the most part, from 1945 to the mid-70s. So we had, we had a virtuous cycle. So the middle class is growing, they're getting more money, they have more purchasing power, they get to buy more things, which then means we need to produce more things. So there's a nice virtuous cycle, circle. We don't live in that world anymore, and we're not going back to that world anymore. And, and it's interesting you say Apple, right? Because while Apple designs everything in the US, everything from Apple is manufactured in China and Southeast Asia for workers that make $2 a day, roughly they're not going to all of a sudden bring back those jobs and have to pay $20 an hour, an hour, when those workers are making $2 a day. So we really have to be imaginative about new ways to grow a middle class. Of the growing jobs in this post-recession, eight, eight of the top 10 occupations in terms of growing job growth, all low-wage jobs. 
So now we don't, we basically don't have a middle class and it's shrinking, I mean it's shrinking. We have a, what we might call an hourglass economy. So a lot of jobs at the top, high skill, high wage jobs, and then a lot of jobs at the bottom, low skill, low wage jobs. And unless we figure out a way to create, again, jobs in the middle, because they, they just don't come out of the air, you actually have to create those jobs, whether through forcing employers to pay more, et cetera. We're going to continue to have this kind of economy for the foreseeable future. A whole bunch of people at the bottom, and then some people at the top with the 1% continuing to do extraordinarily well. So it's a really great question, and we really need everybody's brain power in this room to really figure out what are the kinds of, what kind of economy do we want? What kind of a society do we want? Do we really want a society that's simply some rich people and then a whole bunch of poor people? You, you know, and it's really, as you say, it really is a tough problem because if you look at, say, Costco, mm -hmm. right, as compared to Walmart, mm -hmm. right, where although Costco pays a higher wage, right, probably twice as mm -hmm. much as Walmart pays, mm -hmm. they hire very few employees. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah, the, um, another way to think of it is that the 20th century was the, the, the century of General Motors, if you, right? We are now in the 21st century, we're, we're now in the era of Walmart. And not only is it a question of low-wage jobs, but most of the one million employees at Walmart want to work full-time and aren't allowed to because Walmart would have to pay for benefits, health care benefits and pension benefits if they go over a certain amount of hours. So that's the new normal for us, and we really have to think through how to, how to create something different, how to recreate a middle class. Great. I think you might have a drink. Guys. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, we're going to take one more question, but please excuse Dr. Warren, who has a train to catch, and you know they don't come very often <laughs> in this neighborhood. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Uh, and we'd like to hear from you. Hi. Thank, Thank you all for you. coming, and uh, hopefully you don't miss your train. <laughs> but. Um, I just want to ask out of opinion, uh, I, I would like to know your opinion because I, I follow the, um, this campaign, this presidential campaign as much as I could. I've seen the debates, I do my readings uh, for both candidates, but I'm, I think a lot of um, students and a lot of voters share this, we're still undecided. Um, and I do believe in equality and justice regardless of partisanship. Um, and can you tell me what do you think, who do you think has the best interest in this campaign for us students and for us women? Be partisan, she's begging. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what you have to do is to, to look at uh, the things that you think are very important to you, right? and then to look at the candidate's stated positions on those issues, right? I, that, that's, I think that's the way to do it. I, I mean, I well, think- Well, then that tells you something, right? Yeah. If they change their position, that means you can't trust them. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say too, so yes, so not putting on my, a partisan hat, but at the same point, I think there is accountability to, for, for both candidates. It speaks a little bit to what you were saying about sort of asking the right questions and mm -hmm. pushing them on certain issues. I think that you could argue wherever you stand in terms of at least in terms of women's issues and equality, um, that neither candidate has done an astoundingly good job um, at talking about women. Um, both of them have very much relied on their wives, um, which is an interesting dynamic that we see. This is not new, um, but this is something that we see in campaigns over and over again because um, this sense that, um, you know, well, let me, M Michelle knows what it's like to balance work and family. The president has said that. That's a bad line um, because he, right, he balances work and family too. Um, or, um, or, you know, Ann Romney, sort of my wife um, raised my kids and knows how this works. So, you know, questions like that. I think pushing, um, it would be sort of pushing both of them now on, on talking more explicitly about the policies that are going to affect you as a woman as a student um, and seeing which person is offering both the legislative sort of policy 
agendas that would actually get move forward, um, move move us forward in those regard in the direction you'd like to see, but also their 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 past and what they're saying they've done in the past, um, and that's something on on both fronts um, where you know you can watch the debate and sort of hear what they say about what they've done, but you can also follow up um, and try to see what their record is, and I think. When you do that, you, you do see a clearer record for both of them, on, on, at least on gender issues. Um, and uh, I know somebody mentioned Paycheck Fairness and Lily Ledbetter. That's one thing. Um, uh, I, I would argue on that front, the president hasn't spoken very well on, on Paycheck Fairness, right? He, he's talked a lot about the Ledbetter Act, but there's um, more to be done in terms of equal pay. And, and people need to sort of learn about that. What do we need to do? What do we need to press? Um, and then uh, on contraception and reproductive health, if that's something that's important to you, there's been a lot of back and forth and changing of positions. Um, again, president included last year, um, but it's, it's important to look at, at, at both records. So it's not an answer to say who to vote for, but it is an answer to say, at least on those issues, there are records to look at, and there are places to find them, and that may be helpful. Okay. Um, could I make a quick question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what would be a quote that you will say to express your political view? <laughs> it's easy. I come from a nonpartisan research center. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I would say in terms of political strategy, it's to be engaged, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm not committed to any political party, right? I, I like to think that I uh, try to decide who I'm going to vote for in terms of uh, what brings about uh, justice and fairness. And, and I'll say that often I've found that the, <clears throat> the Democratic Party has uh, done a better job, I think, but uh, I haven't always voted for, for Democrats. What about you? Um. <laughs> See, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a good question to think about, right? Um, to sort of think, and I think that speaks to your undecided question, is sort of like, actually, there probably is. Mm -hmm. If you really sit down and look at an agenda of issues and positions and ph philosophies about equality, justice, mm -hmm. democracy, these things we've been talking about. Um, if you line them up with some sort of partisan precedent, there's going to be some leaning. There's going to be a way that you lean. I think it's hard to be purely independent. Um, but it takes some work. It takes some homework. Um, and it, it takes more than watching a debate or watching Fox or MSNBC, either one. Excellent. Uh, Can I just say one thing? I'm an independent. I just want everybody to know that. I vote for whoever's the best person. But I heard something coming here today that really scared me, and that was that they don't expect the youth of America to vote in that much this year because they're so disillusioned by all of the flip-flops. And I just think that that's the most important thing, to get out and vote. So don't stay undecided. <laughs> Decide. <laughs> Decide. Thank you so much, panelists.